I would like to introduce Dr. Katie Gorgan, who will be speaking to us uh, this morning about regional wall motion abnormalities. Thank you so much. So uh, my topic, myocardial perfusion and then regional wall motion abnormalities. And I'm speaking from um, an anesthesiologist's perspective, so we'll conclude with some transesophageal echoes that um, we'll give you a chance to kind of look at to see where you think a regional wall motion abnormality might be. Here's the outline of where we're going. I'll tell you the first couple of points are going to be more medical school review of what coronary artery anatomy uh, and variants, uh, and then we'll get into the regional wall motion abnormalities. So normal anatomy, as you know, the thing I wanted to point out are just some variants in normal anatomy. So the left main can travel anywhere between two millimeters and two centimeters. So if you're interpreting um, casts as a anesthesia provider or surgery provider, it's important to get oriented with just some of these normal uh, variants, I'd say. The LAD is going to have diags and septal perforators as well as um, the other two that I've underlined there, the marginal branches, the obtuse coming off the left circ and the acute marginal coming off the right coronary. So it's important to kind of think of the travel of the coronary artery as well. So these are gonna be in the epicardial fat in the uh, AV groove and the anterior interventricular groove. And so you're peering over the drapes or maybe the surgeon's perspective and you can see they have to cut down a little bit through the epicardial fat to locate um, the coronary arteries itself, themselves for distal grafts. And occasionally a patient could have um, an ischemic type of um, event due to myocardial bridging or passing of the coronary arteries through the myocardium. And so you can imagine how with systole you could get compression and coronary ischemia. So perfusion territories, the picture on the right is um, standard like ASC um, guideline image um, image guidance of where you're supposed to look on a transthoracic echo. So on the right-hand side here, you can see that four-chamber, two-chamber, and a long axis, those are all oriented with regard to a transthoracic echo, but you can just invert the image and see where those perfusion territories would be for a transesophageal echo. And so thinking from the standpoint of a uh, more common variant, so most of us, this is the territory that's going to be fed by, let's say, our LAD in green or our CA in blue, and obviously, um, you do have people with variant anatomy, and that's what you would pick up on a cath. So between um, the cath and the regional wall motion abnormality, you'd be able to isolate where the ischemia is occurring. And the left side, you probably appreciate um, which territories those no normally feed. So I um, crossed out the word abnormalities here. So some of the variants that we see every day intraoperatively and are just um, interesting to be aware of. Um, your patient's coronary dominance, so the inferior wall, the left ventricle, most commonly, 70% of us, that's going to be from our RCA, but certainly uh, not uncommon to be either co-dominant or left dominant. The ramus artery that I've um, got noted next to that, a ramus would be if your left main trifurcated instead of bifurcated, and so you have a artery called the ramus, which occurs in 10 to 30% of uh, normals and that would just supply the territories that the circumflex or the LAD would otherwise supply in that same uh, anatomical area. And then as far as uh, rhythm abnormalities, usually we always say right coronary disease and that we leave it at that, but it's important to keep in mind that 34% of people may supply their SA node by um, origination from the left circumflex, and the AV node generally goes with whatever the co-dominant artery is in that patient. And then other common variants that you'll see um, intraoperatively or by cath would be acute takeoff of the left circ from the left main, a high takeoff of the RCA from the aorta, and then a shepherd's crook RCA, which um, you can just look those up um, like on Google. They're just um, common things that you might see as variants, but important to be aware of. And then abnormalities as far as just anatomical um, being present in less than 1% of the population it is possible to have, or the, the most common ones I just want to highlight would be a separate takeoff of the left uh, anterior descending and circumflex, or the left circumflex actually arising from the RCA. So those are two most commonest. And as far as pathology, in sudden cardiac death in young athletes, the second most common etiology is actually a course of the coronary arteries between the PA and the aorta. And you can imagine how, um, just like was mentioned earlier in systole, when that um, LVO outflow and uh, aorta are engorged with blood that could compress between the PA and cause ischemia. And then venous drainage is, um, again, just a quick review here, but um, you probably all appreciate that most coronary venous blood is draining into the coronary sinus. It's important to keep in mind 
that with the anterior cardiac vein, that's territory that's going to be draining directly into the right ventricle, into, from the right ventricle the, into the right atria. And so a retrograde catheter for cardioplegia would actually not protect that territory um, as purely as it would the other territories if you're, if you're thinking about uh, retrograde cardioplegia. And the, re the rest of that you can read through or read through afterwards, but um, just discussing true shunt or anatomical shunt. So some numbers that you may already know, but just to keep in mind that the heart is taking about 5% of our cardiac output, but a very high and efficient extractor of uh, oxygen from the hemoglobin. And so one, um, one thing just very practically, coronary sinus catheters uh, with retrograde cardioplegia, it's very obvious um, to the surgeon if uh, they're in the coronary sinus by the color of the blood, and that's something we as anesthesiologists should be involved in as well. And um, as I mentioned, the extraction ratio is very high. It's about 70 to 80%, so that's very dark blood. It's pretty obvious when they're in the coronary sinus. Um, the third or fourth bullet point there, the reduced perfusion at higher heart rates due to reduced diastolic time. So it's important to consider tachycardia as uh, an offender as far as our diastole, and so our systole stays relatively fixed at about 200 milliseconds, but the diastolic component can be shortened and that can cause um, increased risk for ischemia. And then uh, lastly here, as far as vasomotor tone, generally our coronaries are um, good to us and we're in a state of vasodilation. The mechanisms for that, we can look at on this very busy slide, and I appreciate that it's very busy to take in all at once, but um, in this picture on the right, vasoconstrictors, vasodilators. And so even in a set, set of, um, a state of like sympathetic stimulation, you have more of a beta-2 vasodilatory effect to keep you in a state of vasodilation as compared to alpha constriction. And so um, all of the factors on the right are helping to keep that coronary artery myocardial perfusion in a vasodilated state. And, uh, metabolically, I'd like to just point out the first um, element there. So hypoxia leads to adenosine release, and that adenosine is responsible for the um, vasodilation at the coronary um, level and keeping us in that state of vasodilation. Neuron neuronal, humoral, and endothelial factors are more minor, but you can see how um, majority of those are going to tend toward a vasodilata vasodilated state. So what limitations do we have in myocardial perfusion and coronary blood flow? The distal arterial certainly will dilate um, to a certain point until there is a element of fixed stenosis, if you will. So approximately 50% stenosis is when our coronaries are unable to respond to increased demand, and about 80% is when we're gonna see that type of symptomatology at rest. Um, I also want to point out targets of coronary artery bypass grafting. So from my perspective um, in anesthesiology, I always I, I kind of think like, well, how do they know exactly where they want to put that distal graft? And frankly, the evidence is sort of mixed. It's a little bit intra-institutional practice, or this is the way I do um, cabbage grafts. So there's really little hard data regarding what size a vessel should be targeted. Do we target areas that will have continued diffuse vessel disease? Do we perform coronary endarterectomies? Um, we as in the surgeons. But so where are we going to target to relieve the limitation in coronary blood flow? And from our standpoint, um, honestly, most, as you'd assume, most anesthesiology um, targets are going to be in pharmacology. So as far as drugs and how they can increase myocardial perfusion, um, I have them listed there with more specific answers to their mechanism, which most of that you probably um, would be aware of. But um, I just want to include that specifically for, for beta blockers, as an example. They actually have less negative inotropy than previously thought, and so tending toward what can we do pharmacologically about vasodilation? Um, all of these would be advantageous in that sense. And certainly the last uh, bullet point po points out that if somebody is in a state of um, hypotension, you're adding a presser, or in a state of um, reduced inotropy, adding an inotrope, you are tending to reduce the LVEDP. And obviously just by the math, that should be advantageous in terms of um, perfusion pressure. So. The, the main part that I wanted to talk to you guys about is regional wall motion abnormalities. For uh, anesthesiologists in the room, you're going to be doing this every day with your, not just your bypass cases, but any, um, any valve case as well, or any case that's uh, necessitating transesophageal echo. The clips I included are all um, from a transesophageal standpoint, and that's uh, generally what the um, 
what, what you'd probably be seeing intraoperatively. So etiologies of regional wall motion abnormalities. To the second point here, it's important, I think, to be aware that everything that is a regional wall motion abnormality is not necessarily ischemic. And so we've got uh, things such as myocarditis, Takotsubo, as well as post-pump changes such as uh, RV pacing or right bundle branch block. So those are um, kind of things to, to rule out as possible causes. And then the vast majority obviously being ischemic. Uh, as was mentioned this morning, and you already know intraoperatively, you're going to see um, physiologic uh, things on the echo way before you're going to see them on the EKG. And certainly if you don't have non-invasive or invasive monitors, you're not going to see hemodynamic changes for um, much, much greater time. So echoes are a friend. That's the first place we're going to look. The picture on the left just is emphasizing the fact that you can divide the myocardium of the LV up into different segments. Usually a 16-segment or 17-segment model is used if we include the apical cap of the LV. And by dividing it up more uh, mathematically, we can focus on what tissue we're specifically talking about uh, as far as referring to colleagues or a surgeon where we see a regional wall motion abnormality. And uh, certainly, we're usually speaking qualitatively about, about hypokinesis, akinesis, as far as what we're just seeing qualitatively with our eye. And if you wanted to be more uh, mathematical about that, I suppose, you can calculate what's called a wall motion score index. And uh, contrasting to usually bigger numbers better in this case, you're summing the quality of the wall motion, both wall thickening and motion, with normal or hyperkinetic being one, all the way to, to dyskinesis being four. So usually a bigger number is better in this case. We're dividing by the number of segments assessed, and so a smaller number would be more um, in line with normal wall motion. And then quantitatively, uh, the echo has the ability to use um, like speckle tracking or Doppler to get more quantitative about um, hypokinesis, akinesis, and dyskinesis. So I have a few examples here, and we're just going to let the first one play. So for orientation, transesophageal echo, the left atria in the foreground and the left ventricle distally, we're cut at 90 degrees, so we have the inferior wall of the heart in the back here, and anterior kind of that way. Um, so who's, who's used to viewing transesophageal images? All the anesthesiologists or any of the surgeons needing orientation? On that, okay. So just looking at the anterior wall versus the inferior wall, I just kind of put an error, er, arrow very globally. Like if we just said qualitatively, kind of squint your eyes a bit and look at those walls, you could kind of say globally, the back wall or the inferior wall of the heart doesn't look quite as kinetic as the anterior wall. And so we're not going to get into like a you know 16 segment model on this, but if you just look at that, you can kind of appreciate that the inferior wall is hypokinetic, less mobile than the anterior wall. And so you start to think about comparing to cath results, comparing to lesions, where are they going to graph today, um, assuming the patient has normal uh, coronary anatomy, and that can help you decide where the lesion might be. Similar, exact same uh, cut here through the heart of 90 degree with the left atria, left ventricle. And in this picture, you can see some spontaneous echo contrast or the, the contrast of just the blood. So the ejection, and you think about those vortices and, and the um, efficiency of the heart, as was mentioned this morning, and clearly this blood is sitting kind of like a cesspool in the LV, and that is the uh, spontaneous echo contrast that we're seeing. So right there, you're thinking probably something's regionally affected. And... I'll just pop it up there. So the first example was more of a hypokinetic, like it's moving, it's not thickening, it's not moving toward the center of the LV as efficiently as its colleagues anteriorly or septally. But here we can pretty clearly say that that inferior wall seems to be akinetic, not moving at all. Now, I'd also like to just uh, mention, uh, as was noted in the previous slide with that diagram, you're going to think about these in basal, mid papillary and apical. So as the coronary artery traverses into different territories, you're going to divide that up more sophisticatedly and uh, not just say the whole back of the heart doesn't work. Here's a long axis view. Uh, similarly, the left atria is at the top, LVS at the bottom, and we, we can see the LV outflow into aortic valve. So long axis view here, and then out into the aortic valve with the right uh, heart sitting out front. <laughs> 
I'll give you guys a second to kind of look at that. I think it kind of helps to squint your eyes and kind of look at it for a bit and convince yourself that somebody's not doing the same amount of uh, kinesis. And you start to notice the anteroceptal territory. And I think we can uh, reliably be concerned for two different territories here. So if you look at both the infralateral and the anteroceptal, both seem to be affected there. So a four chamber that's a bit out of sight with the aortic valve included. So not, not a pure four chamber, but left atria, left ventricle, and then on the left side of the screen, we've got the right ventricle and the right atria is not uh, included in this clip. We'll just let that play for a moment. Free wall, doing some movement, right, right ventricular free wall, moving. How about the septum? Do we see much activity there? And again, it's important to think not just um, moving toward the center of the LV or coming into a smaller chamber in systole, but also wall thickening. And that's where speckle tracking and uh, Doppler would be more advantageous if you wanted to be very quantitative about wall motion abnormality. And if you do see, um, this next clip is my last one actually, but it includes a little bit of a translational aspect where um, the, the heart or the myocardium may appear to be moving, but it could be translational, just moving because of other territories or even um, the patient's uh, movement itself. So short axis of the LV, and because it's a transesophageal, we have the inferior wall closer to the apex um, of the screen and the anterior wall out front. Uh, the left side of the screen is the septum and then lateral closest to me here. We'll let that play. So at first glance, if you had to just think about ejection fraction or something very, um, uh, just a quick, oh, that's 55, 60. Regional wall motion abnormality, I didn't mention it in the written portion there, but it's important to think that you could have a minor wall motion abnormality. It doesn't mean that you have a dropped ejection fraction. So many factors are coming into play, such as diastolic dysfunction, volume status of the patient, um, minor or major regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, so you could have a preserved ejection fraction and a very subtle regional change. And so we've seen that play a bit there. And if we kind of look at the interventricular septum there, uh, oops, is it still gonna play? Yeah, so we look at the interventricular septum, and yes, there might be some translational motion. It seems to be moving a bit toward the uh, center of the LV, but the thickening, I think, is what gives it away in this clip. The uh, interventricular septum does not appear to be thickening, and so uh, the, the akinesis of the septum, I think, is given away by the thickening not being present. Okay, and here are the references, and thank you guys for listening, and I think I made up some time. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah.